Uh, we're excited to be here and excited that the HBRA asked us to put on uh, this uh, educational session. I thought it would be insightful and helpful to the builder community and the uh, participants in the HBRA to engage with a group of folks that they probably don't typically engage with, uh, which is the supply cha chain upstream in the lumber and commodities markets. Obviously, we're in a, like everyone likes to say pretty much every day, on the next new unprecedented time that we've been in. Um, we are in a time that's incredibly exciting and incredibly challenging, and people want Know, how is this going to affect me? Uh, so I have a couple people on the phone and I'm going to moderate a discussion with them uh, to hopefully shed some light on how this is going to affect us, um, affect you, uh, the builder community, and the participants in the HBRA. And hopefully you can generate a little bit of insight to not just take back to your company, but to your clients that you speak to on a daily basis. Um, the intentions of this is not to be a formal presentation. It's meant to be an active moderated panel. And as Carrie said, if you have any questions, uh, please just ch chat me. I uh, would love to keep the conversation rolling. If we go off on a tangent on one topic, that would be great. Um, let's, you know, this is a, let's just say a, a live podcast, so to say, uh, with a couple industry experts and definitely take advantage of uh, their expertise uh, while we can. Um, before we jump into some of the, the the panel questions. Uh, we'll just quickly introduce our company so you uh, know kind of who you're who you're hearing from. So, like Carrie said, I'm Jason Cohen. I run Northeast Building Supply. Uh, we have operations in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, we sell uh, lumber, building materials, windows, and doors. Uh, we have hardware stores. Uh, we are an active participant in the HBRA, and uh, in Fairfield County, we are in New Canaan and in Bridgeport, and we also have an operation in Cornwall Bridge, Connecticut, up in the northwest corner. Um, Kyle, I'll just jump to you quickly to introduce uh, your, yourself and your company. Uh, great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here for a minute uh, just to kind of give a little overview as I know Christian uh, is uh, very well prepared. So I'm going to actually hand it off to him because the slides are in the order of that. So Christian, you want to give a little overview of JD, yourself and JD Irving? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, guys. So glad to be uh, with you guys uh, this afternoon. Nice to see the, the weather finally breaking for, for all of us. Uh, I'll go quickly through what's, uh, what's GD Irving and what's GD Irving all about. And I'll dive, I'll try to dive as much as I can to help answer the question is this is $1,300 uh, lumber uh, here to stay or, or what's it going to do? I mean, everyone that has heartbeat should be concerned, I guess, that $1,300 when an average of probably the last 30, 35 years, we've traded lumber between uh, 300 to 400. So we'll, we'll try to look at the microeconomics and, and in big picture, it boils down to supply and demand, but uh, we'll dive into it in a second. Uh, first, appreciate the opportunity and I'll go through uh, what's JD Irving all about. Um, if you look, uh, Kyle, I mean, maybe the next slide I'll show. So it's a company we've been in business for 139 years. Uh, started with a small sawmill, Mr. James Irving here. 139 years ago, small stud mill, and then KC in the 50s, and then the picture at the bottom, uh, who you see is the present owner. You've got a third generation in the middle with JK, and you've got his two sons, uh, Robert and JD, uh, that are co-CEO of our company. And right now, there's the, there's the uh, four, a fifth and sixth generation uh, growing through the ranks right now. The sixth generation, I think, six, seven years old. So they're, they're growing through the ranks. Um, just maybe back up. For a second, GD Irving, we're 16,000 full time employees. Uh, we're in eight core uh, business segments uh, potato fields, agriculture. Uh, we've got the, we're the largest train operators in eastern Canada. Uh, we're probably a fourth or fifth, um, as far as food, fourth or fifth potato fry producer in North America with 3.4 billion pounds. Uh, we do TP, which we call to toilet paper and facial tissue in the US with Scotties. Um, we are the ninth lar largest producer of lumber in North America and uh, the fifth largest landowner as well in North America. Uh, we own and operate 85 retail location uh, lumber distribution um, in, in Eastern Canada, about 60,000 square foot. Um, and one important segment, we just signed a $25 billion contract to build uh, the Royal Navy, uh, Canadian Navy, about eight to 10 uh, naval frigates. 
And just an important or interesting fact, we probably built, not probably, but we did build 90% of the naval fleet, the naval fleet over the last 100 years. Uh, we do own about 3,500 trucks and trailers and 500 miles of, of rail that connects us from Northern uh, Canada, Northeastern Canada to Connecticut, basically. So in a nutshell, that's our company. So I'll go through quickly the rest of the slides here on, on J.D. Irving. Uh, so from sea to shelf, from, we're one of the largest a tree planter in North America. We've planted a billion trees, so we always like to see our core business is, is we start at the seed with the land and we end up at the end user uh, product consumer. Um, next slide, Kyle. Uh, this is the map of our operation, guys. So as you can see, uh, we're in Eastern Canada, just to uh, locate yourself. You see me, a uh, main air on the left, and you see New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, which is called Atlantic Provinces, uh, on, on your right. Everything that's in, uh, in green, is uh, our freehold, which is the land that we, uh, that we own. Like I said, it's uh, close to 6.4 million acres that we own and operate basically in Eastern Canada. And we're one of the largest, uh, we are the largest landowner in Maine. So that's basically our location, the uh, current location. Uh, 10 sawmills on that map. We have two sawmills in Maine, uh, seven in New Brunswick and one in Nova Scotia for, for 10 sawmills. Uh, I did mention that fifth largest uh, private landowner in North America. Billion tree planted. We do plant about 30 million trees a year. And we're, uh, that's our name to fame with the tree growing company. And it starts with the land, but then we, we uh, promote the regeneration through plantation. So, again, we don't think about, I mean, for the company, we always think 80 to 100 years ahead. We're not about tomorrow. We're not about tomorrow's pricing or today's pricing. We always think about the future and we're always thinking 80 to 100 years ahead. And that's been probably the most important aspect of our company and why we've been so successful. I have to admit is that we always think ahead. It's a family driven company with family value, but long-term we're, we're in the long game here. We're not in tomorrow's pricing. Uh, as far as our operation, we produce about 1.1 billion FBM, about a billion FBM of spruce, uh, 100 million FBM of pine, a fine, and then we have a bit of hardwood that we uh, that we collect through our, our forest and field. Uh, through all our efforts that we put into uh, our land regeneration, the last five years we've seen a growth of 21 percent, and the the positive news here is the next five years or four to five years, we're going to see close to a 20% growth in our, our, our uh, annual production. As you can see where we were in 2015 or 2020 at the yellow bar 1.1, but we expect with our investment, both in our sawmills efficiency and on our land and reforestation will be close to 1.4 million of them in the next, uh, the next three to five years. So it's going to be quite a contrast after I'm done telling you the story that I've, uh, I've uh, contabulated over the last uh, three, four days, overall the supply in North America is shrinking, uh, but J.D. Irving, it's gonna grow another 20% in the years ahead. So in a nutshell, guys, that's J.D. Irving. And uh, thank you, Christian. So I think before Kyle, before you jump in, I think it's important for those on the phone to understand where <clears throat> us in Fairfield County, we're a Doug Fir buyer and uh, Christian is a, a supplier of, and miller of spruce. Uh, that being said, uh, the markets do pretty much work in tandem, and uh, they, until recently, uh, spruce was a uh, commodity that was priced under Doug Fir, but that seems to really fluctuate now on a daily basis. And uh, in terms of supply and production, um, the things that are impacting Christian in Canada are very similar things that are impacting our Doug Fir suppliers in the West Coast. Um, so, you know, the facts, the stuff that Christian shares and the information he has, the insights are going to be just as good for us in the Fairfield County market as they will be from, you know, anyone across the country. Um, but uh, Kyle, how about you uh, just quickly 
um, share a little bit about Sherwood? Yeah, so Sherwood Lumber is also a family owned and operated business. We have not been uh, uh, in the industry as long as uh, the Irving family or our our, the, our ownership has not been in the business as long as the Irving family. But now we're roughly half of that, sev almost 70 years now that Sherwood Lumber has been uh, uh, operating in the tri-state area. That's where it started. Uh, uh, and now uh, selling uh, forest products across the nation. Uh, we uh, are fall in the in the supply chain as the middleman. We are taking large bulk purchases from the producers like JD Irving, like Sierra Pacific, like uh, Dunkley, like uh, whoever it's West Fraser, Canfor, and so forth, and taking those bulk purchases and breaking them down and shipping them uh, to dealers across the country. Um, uh, we. Uh, um, are, are very much pride ourselves in having uh, um, a highly diversified, uh, highly inventoried uh, um, supply chain and distribution to go and service uh, the, the dealer base uh, in the uh, in this market. Our tagline is we'll be there. We'll be there with product, we'll be there with service, and we'll be there with quality. Just a little overview of Sherwood Lumber, where we are. We're headquartered in Melville, New York, sitting here today on the middle of Long Island. We have 90 employees across the country. Uh, we uh, do an annual volume of around 800 million board feet. Uh, cam you know, uh, Christian being a producer produces just over uh, 1.1 million board feet, or sorry, 1.1 billion board feet. Uh, we're uh, slightly below that, about uh, uh, three quarters of that total volume. Uh, but you can see that it's uh, not on just KD SPF, but it's on KD Dugfer, it's on KD uh, Spruce, Southern Yellow Pine, Hempfer, uh, all the panel products and, and such. So uh, we currently uh, sell to uh, um, over 2,000 customers across the nation, shipping to over 6,000 specific destinations. And we sold in all of the continuous uh, 48 states in 2020. Uh, what we actually buy and sell, uh, we are 70% um, of what we buy is something that we would physically touch in any one of our uh, distribution centers that are located throughout the country. The balance of that would be something that we would direct ship from a producer like like Christian and JD Irving uh, directly to a customer via truck rail uh, or possibly uh, some ocean bound stuff that we might be importing from uh, Europe, Asia or South America. Um, that's just a general overview of Sherwood Lumber. Um, okay. Jason, I'll take it, I'll um, pass it back to you. Awesome, thanks Kyle. So before we jump into a couple questions, I uh, came across something on LinkedIn that I thought was uh, funny, um, scary, but worth sharing. <laughs> about how uh, us on the supply chain, uh, on the sell side are feeling about what's going on. It was uh, a quick note that's been floated around now to about you know, a few thousand people. Uh, but here on the supply chain, this is kind of sums up what's happening. Yes, lumber is high. Yes, it used to be cheaper. No, we are not getting rich. No, we do not know when it's coming down. Yes, it's going to get worse. And yes, it's high at Lowe's and Home Depot as well. Um, so we're gonna try to dive into a few of those points, but I have, but that is kind of the market we're in. Um, obviously, the unprecedented times brings unknown future. Uh, so we're going to do our best to kind of address some of these things and uh, hopefully leave all of you with a, a few insights. Um, so that's you know a good segue into my first question to Christian and Kyle. I, I think it's important to understand a little in a little bit deeper detail, how did we get here? Um, we all know that the pandemic uh, was raging and it is still ongoing. Um, we know that forecast uh, and production was dropped off as a result of what thought was going, we thought was going to happen as a result of the pandemic. And in turn, the opposite happened um, and demand went through the roof. Um, so we're here now, uh, but in regards to some macro and micro factors, uh, I'd love to hear from both of you guys from your perspective, um, how do we get here? So I guess I'll take uh, the first part of this question. I think the biggest reason that we got here um, is because of what happened 10 uh, to 12 years ago. Um, housing is a leading indicator on any aspect. And in many cases, it's the biggest driver of, of all parts of the economy. It's the biz biggest investment that any one single person has at any given time in their life, in most cases. And uh, it tends to be where we tend to overproduce or underproduce the market over a period of time. And what led the financial collapse in 2008 was overbuilding and housing. And what's going to lead the, the financial recovery and uh, um, the next cycle of 10 to 20 years will be uh, the, the um, 
family formation and uh, the building of a home. So uh, you can see that when we overbuilt in this, this slide that I'm presenting, um, this is provided by the Forest Economic Advisors, that they're a, a, um, an independent group of, of uh, economists and uh, what they've measured in the, in the way that we overbuilt uh, since 95 to 2008 to where we've underbuilt from 2008 to today. Uh, has created a tremendous amount of backlog of, of demand. And we've dug ourselves a hole, so to speak, and now we have to dig ourselves out of it. And the reason that we're seeing uh, accelerated demand today uh, and uh, um, under supplied marketplace is because uh, we um, made, you know, uh, essentially readjusted our supply base to the demand that was happening over that time where we were underbuilding. And now that the curve is now moving upward, uh, we need to readjust. And uh, what is happening now uh, with the surge in demand uh, is creating a, you know, a, a tremendous amount of stress on the overall system. So, and we'll continue to do so until we can start to see some more production start to meet that, that cycle. But we've gotten here because of the extreme disparity that we overbuilt in the early 2000s to now where we've underbuilt in the uh, from 2010 and beyond. And uh, it's going to take some time to work us back through that cycle to get back into to equilibrium. Christian, you want to add anything? Well, the, there's a supply uh, demand ratio, of course, and I'll touch on, on touch well, uh, Kyle, on the demand aspect. On the supply side, why we got here, I guess, is, is basically uh, there's too much demand for, for current supply, I guess, or, or for versus the supply that we're currently experiencing. Uh, we did experience since 2015 a major reduction, basically, in production across North America. Uh, we, can, we can think about the beetle kill in the West. We can uh, think of the record uh, forest fires that we saw in, in Western uh, U.S. this past year was a record season. Uh, the two previous uh, seasons, uh, years, I should say, we had record forest fires in D.C. Uh, so all in all, if you look, I had a few slides in there that showed uh, we reduced production by 4 billion FBM less uh, in D.C. over the last period between 2015 to 2020. 17 mills closed um, over that period and, and showing uh, 17, I mean, 4 billion FVM less of production. So you just, it's fairly simple. You add probably a six to, or five to 15% increase in demand. We did see the 1.8, 1.9 million uh, permits uh, recently. And I think the industry right now can only supply 1.3, 1.4 million housing starts. And the main thing of course is the reduction in BC. Uh, it seems like the capacity in, in Eastern Canada, uh, if any mills could produce one stick of lumber more uh, at those $1,300, they would, but we haven't seen that. It's very slow. Uh, there's basically no trees in Eastern Canada to increase production. Uh, I didn't mention we're going to see a reduction. Or we saw a reduction because of the forest fires in, in Western uh, U.S., so the only uh, point of salute, I guess, is U.S. South. I guess we're going to see a little more production U.S. South. But all in all, guys, I want to say is just an imbalance between supply and demand, where there's just not enough production uh, to cover that, that great increase in new housing, repair and remodeling, uh, non-residential application, and, and even the furniture building for so on. So it's just enough, uh, not enough supply guys, basically. So, so if I could, if I could sum it up, I mean, it sounds like <clears throat> it's a, a post financial crisis problem uh, that led to a severe underbuilding. Uh, and then in the last five to seven years, uh, a combination of um, su significant reduction in production um, across not just Canada, but the entire country. Um, on top of the fact, you know, Christian, you, you alluded to in a conversation you and I had about a reduction in planting that is also taking place. And now we're in an environment where things are accelerating faster than we've ever seen before. And, you know, we're basically playing, playing catch up. And it sounds like it's a, and in addition to that, the first question a lot of people ask too is like, well, you know, lumber prices never got this high when we were building 2 million housing starts in the early 2000s. Why are they this high now? And why is production going down in British Columbia? 
Uh, Christian, you want to talk a little bit about that? Why production is 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 less in in BC and in Canada right now because of the over uh, uh, over uh, uh, cutting and over production that we that was required in the early two thousands. Yeah. So basically, from the slide there, I didn't mention it. I touch on it. I guess if you look twenty ten on the right, that's a BC lumber producer. And the why we focus on BC, they used to supply half of Canadians' uh, production. And, and probably 25% of North Americans uh, demand, I guess, is used to supply. So that's why we focus a little bit, bit more in, on BC. But the start of the, the uh, in 2010, I guess, we did start here or even a little earlier about beetle kill infestation. So in BC, they had to increase production in order to salvage those dead trees. If not, those dead trees would turn into dust. And we reach almost 13 billion FDM of production in BC. Uh, in 2015, 2016, basically. But that was the peak of that era. Basically, we reached the peak. And as you see from the graph, uh, 2020, we barely produced 9 billion FDM in, in BC. So that was a three and a half to four to four and a half billion feet of production less that was taken out in a, in a five year period. And the market just couldn't adjust, I guess, to that big drop in production. Yeah, and, and I, I think. You know, we all, production doesn't speed up that fast. So when production drops off like it did um, in a market that was half the size of the, the demand that was half the size of it is now, um, there's no chance uh, that we can survive in the existing market. Um, so you know that's that's a little bit of a broad a broader overview of um, what's going on. Um, I did want to uh, bring up a, a second question. So. Christian, you alluded to earlier, we're in this 1300 buck a thousand range on lumber. So us on the retail side, you know, on the builder side, we don't really deal in board footage or 1300 bucks a thousand. We kind of deal in retail prices. Um, so I, what I wanted to ask you guys is in this current pricing range, um, are we, have we reset the range to this higher level? And to use a reference point, um, a lot of people always reference half in CDX as something that they look at as a barometer for the market. A half in CDX is north of 35 bucks right now. I mean, we're heading towards 40 bucks a, a board, which is to a lot of builders that are on the phone um, who have built for 25, 30, 40 years is an absolutely absurd number. Um, are we here for an indefinite future? Kyle, you wanna start with that one or? Yeah, um, yeah, I'd be happy. I, th I, I believe that we are in a higher price range for an undetermined period of time because of not just because uh, everybody talks about this, the, the new norm, and uh, uh, we have tried to determine, okay, what is this new nor norm in the, in the prices, and we've never been at these prices even the 2018 uh, peak, but we did get there and then we actually went through them and doubled them, uh, the numbers uh, here in the most recent run through, through COVID. Um, what I wanna point out is because of that lack of supply or the underbuilding, we were already heading this way anyhow. Uh, and the consumption was greater than the demand and the demand takes a period of time to go out there and get that done. It's just that uh, the time period, uh, time, it's all about timing. And we ultimately are seeing a surge. Will prices move back to some come down, I guess, is the, the question I think a lot of people are under. Yes, they're going to come down, but they're not going to come down to what we historically have uh, deemed as the norm, because the new norm is likely going to be in a range that's much higher than what we've ever experienced in the last 25, 30 years. Um, and the reason I say that is because uh, we did a lot of research uh, in late 2020, trying to determine if we actually were moving into this new norm cycle. And what we found, uh, and I'll put up my screen, uh, what we found was that uh, um, um, there were certain points of data that pushed us, that, that allowed uh, us to uh, understand that there are different inflection points uh, that would change this long-term pricing cycle. And uh, I found through that, uh, that two, two data points, and I won't go into specifically what they, they were, but two data points that ultimately uh, allowed us me to think that we possibly could be going into this new norm. Uh, and, and by doing so, um, what we found is through that period of time, this, this phenomena only happened uh, seven times before that over the last 35 years. 
And in those seven times that this new norm happened or this new pricing structure happened and, and developed, it averaged over 24 months. The longest period of time being a 40 month period, the shortest period of time of being a nine month period. As of today, you know, March 12th, uh, we are sitting in month number eight of this new cycle. Uh, so I would say that we're, I don't, it could be halfway done. I think it's more like a third of the way done. Uh, we're likely in, in order to get us supply and demand in balance, it's gonna take us through the better part of 2021 and likely into the first half of 2022 before we see supply start to meet demand, specifically the current demand. If demand starts to fall because of affordability, uh, then it could be sooner than that time period. But um, the chart on the right that I put up, you can kind of see where we are historically from an affordable perspective and that's housing affordability, right? So what these high prices, yes, are high and the yes have affected builders and yes have affected retailers. But what has been passed through to the consumer is still sitting at a relatively low level uh, based off of the last 30 years or 20, you know, 20 years of data. This is since 1990. Many of you know Ivy Zellman. Uh, she's a lead uh, uh, economist and tracker of home pricing and the whole real estate market and what have you. And what she's measuring here in this chart on the right is affordability. And you can see that 2019 was higher uh, than what we may have seen in 2017, but historically compared to uh, the late cycle of, of uh, the last housing boom, uh, we're about 20 to 30% lower from an affordability standpoint. And in their estimates, they don't see um, with higher interest rates and the higher uh, cost of goods, you know, uh, the product that, that the affordability significantly upticks until we get into uh, the uh, uh, well into 2022. So um, I think really it comes down to, can these prices be sustained for a longer period of time? And the data is showing yes, but it has within a low interest rate environment, uh, in a high liquidity environment with government stimulus, uh, tax credits and so forth, uh, affordability is there. And uh, I think that will continue to keep demand really, really high. I mean, I think this is an inc incredibly important slide because I'm sure everyone on the phone is asking themselves, you know, what's the straw that breaks the camel's back here? You know, are we gonna hit a capitulation point in this market where um, everything is unfavorable, things are unaffordable? And uh, you know what you're showing on the top right, uh, which for those who aren't going to be able to see the slides, it's it's basically showing that we're still we're going to be in a favorable purchasing environment from a homeowner standpoint for a while, uh, because things relative to history, when you add in all the components, interest rates, um, price increases, uh, tax credits, et cetera, uh, we're in a better position today than we are historically. Although it doesn't necessarily seem that way now, um, I, I think you're just seeing that we could work through uh, this cycle, you know, and as Kyle referenced, which could be two years, but we could get through it, you know, we'll not unscathed, but to a point where we're just gonna ride the wave and have to start passing through these costs to the, to the end client. Um, and it sounds like, Kyle, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but there's more costs to be passed through. And that's kind of from a supply chain standpoint, important, an important point to make to, the, the builder community, which is, you know, we're, we're living in this world where things are going to be raised and, uh, and they, they're, we're gonna have to own that, that increasing pricing. And they're gonna have to, we're gonna have to share this difficult, challenging news with the homeowners, but relative to history, and when you add in other components of what their project is, um, we're still actually in a favorable space. Um, it, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think if you look, when really analyze debt to income ratio right now, um, we're at a very, a very, very good spot for the, the millennials that are buying a first time home and uh, those that others that are looking to upgrade their home. Um, they're, they're, we're, we're not in, a, in the same, you know, this, this, unfortunately, this, this um, economic challenge that we've had from a pandemic, it didn't affect the overall workforce like the 2008 one did. Um, and, and, the, and conversely, housing was the cause of that economic collapse. Housing is doing is the opposite. It's a leading indicator of what overall economies can or can't do. And it, it, in many cases, if you look back on you know, GDP uh, uh, history in North America, it's closely correlated 
uh, with housing growth or contraction. Kyle, I'd like to bring a point on uh, the super cycle. If you could put up that slide. Uh, I'd like to bring a few points maybe we didn't touch, I guess, is, is people are strong, strong equity. Uh, we did see the last few years, uh, 10 to 15% uh, growth in, in houses equity in the U.S. own value. That's one thing. The other thing that's, that's pushing this, uh, Kyle, you touched it, uh, government stimulus. We, we know recently the $1.9 trillion. Uh, we've got first-time home buyers, $15,000. So that's just pushing more more demand for, for new construction and new housing. Um, the one thing though, is that that super cycle, uh, one thing I mentioned to my group this morning, right now we're probably at 90%, that was the slide that was done. Uh, you want this one? The super cycle, yeah, we were, right now we're selling products, probably 90% of them are at historical level. Um, I know if you look at North America, but I think globally, and that's one thing I want to stress the importance is globally, we're seeing more demand for lumber than, than our capacity. Um, if you look overall, we're going to see six to 12% growth in demand in, in uh, globally. Uh, you're going to have Europe that's going to grow 300 to 400,000 uh, housing starts in 2021. Uh, we know North America, we're going to see US with, with 1.7, 1.8 million housing starts. Uh, we see the RNR. RNR is gonna grow probably by 4%. Uh, RNR is uh, is uh, closed. They use 20 billion FDM just in RNR uh, through a retail outlet. Uh, that will we'll see an increase in 2021. Uh, you've got non-residential industrial application are gonna grow six to 7%, the demand uh, overall. And, and uh, stuff like CLT, we're going to see a 5 to 10% growth in demand because of CLT, which is a new product. And uh, surprisingly enough, with uh, this post-pandemic, it's nice, nice to say that, that maybe we'll be post-pandemic at one point, but with the post-pandemic uh, economic recovery, people are spending more on furniture. We're going to see more demand for, for wood products there. So all in all, it's between 6 to 10% more demand globally. And uh, based on production data that we've been uh, studying over the last month, we basically it just can't keep up by one to two percent increase. So again, it's a supply demand a supply ratio, but supply just can't uh, can't sustain uh, so, the current demand. Well, so just, there is, just to add, I wanted, uh, to, I, I wanted to just ask one question on that. Go ahead. So you look at this chart and it's uh, very jarring. Um, and, but one thing, Kyle, you mentioned, which is the, the movement that's taking place, which is a new movement in terms of uh, housing is the millennial move, right? And the millennial move is a last five year thing. It's not a last 20 year thing. So um, when you think about whether this is going to be affordable for us, uh, for and, and it affects Fairfield County because there's a lot of millennials now moving from New York City, moving from the greater kind of city environments to the suburbs. Um, can the millennial who is going to be driving this transition uh, absorb this for the foreseeable future? I, you know, I think it go, really just goes back to that chart that I provided on affordability. This is affordability on a first-time home buyer too. Uh, so it's not just looking at the total affordability. Yeah. So I, 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 I believe so um, um, because, you know, the cost – uh, I mean, a rent cost is likely to go down here in the interim because of the, la the excess supply in major metropolitan markets because of what we saw uh, with the flock to suburbia. Uh, but that being said is that, that there's no demand there right now. Um, the demand is to have uh, now uh, work uh, on the family formation. I didn't include that it's in here, but I do have a stat in regard to, you know, where, where we are with the millennials. The, the, the thing about the millennial population, it's just about numbers. Don't talk about their preferences of what they want or where they need it. The fact is the, la the, the biggest population we had in housing that was going into family formation or the last one was the baby boomers. <laughs> And that happened in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s, and where we saw the majority of that. And that's in many cases, they started to buy second homes because they were being very successful at their work and so forth. And that's where we overbuilt uh, through that, you know, early 2000s and what have you. Uh, but the millennials are all turning, you know, the, the vast majority of them are in their late 30s or, or early 40s. And they are now in the process of they've already had 
you know, one or two children and uh, now, and they don't have enough space. So they are by far larger. That whole population is by far larger than the current, than the, than the baby boomer generation. So, and we don't have enough, we've underbuilt for so much, so long over the last eight, uh, eight to 10 years where we were supposed to be averaging at a minimum because of this population growth, 1.5 million housing starts per year. And we only averaged 1.1 to 1.2. So uh, Christian might have the, the actual stat of this, of what the, uh, the, what the undersupply is for uh, US home building, but we have a major, major catch up uh, in regard to that. And uh, on top of it, you know, what is happening today, you can see, I think this chart on the bottom really, really defines it. If you can see, for, for those of you that can see it, is looking at the inventory that's sitting out there for these guys to buy. Uh, since 2004, uh, which is the, uh, was the, when we had, you know, such a high inventory and then 2009 when it was peak, when everything was slowing down, uh, you can see 2020 and then 2021 below that. It's, it's not just low, it's like, we're talking about a third of the normal supply that we, we would keep at any given time. So um, the, it's just, it, it's unbelievable. And then on top, the, the, the graph on the, on the top showing the gap between the orders to build, to uh, purchase a home and, and the orders to start, like that gap continues to be wide. It's, and it's the largest gap that we've ever seen. So what's saying is that uh, we're at peak demand right now, um, and um, it's going to take a period of time for this uh, thing to uh, uh, to shore up. There, I, I think I just want to quickly talk on that point. Um, so for uh, for us in Fairfield County, we have you know we build custom homes, we build spec homes. Um, the spec home market seems to be rebounding in the last uh, eighteen months versus where it was bef um, before the financial crisis when it was incredibly hot and then had died off. Um, one thing that we're starting to see tick up significantly is, is multifamily. Um, when I look at this chart, I would think that, you know, if the millennials coming, whether we like them or not, um, including, including myself, who's currently renting and looking for a home, but to purchase a, a custom home or to design a custom home or purchase a spec home in this environment, you know, might not be effective or, uh, or a cost effective for my family or any of my friends. Um, do we think that the transition um, to building different types of lower cost uh, developments are, is going to be a much more active part of the market and some of the higher end markets that we, that we operate in right now? Um, you know, I think, you know, it's really about personal preference, but I think the multifamily component, which really took a big hit uh, over the last, uh, um, you know, uh, two quarters, um, we'll start to, to come back a little bit more, but it's going to happen in a uh, 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 more remote suburban atmosphere. The work from home phenomena is not going away. I think companies through the pandemic have found uh, a way to be very productive in uh, without having everybody work in a centralized office space. So that desire to have a little bit more space or need, actually need it because you're working from your home right now might not be fulfilled in the multifamily segment. So the single family rise, which historically has been a big, big thing in, in North America, um, um, really took a hit over the last four or five years, but seems to be, there seems to be a resurgence of that since we've moved into this work at home environment. Um, and then, you know, Christian talked about the r, &R the repair and remodel you know, the existing homes that are here here right now, you know, what are most people doing with them, at least from our observations, they're looking at uh, making their home more livable, uh, usable for the work at home environment, usable for, the, unfortunately, the, the school environment that they might have to do in raising a family differently today than what they did in the past. And just, you know, knowing that their home is a place that they are gonna spend more time, you know, making it a more usable space for them. Um, and I think that continues to put uh, added demand on forest products in general. I mean, I, I, th I definitely think that's the, the impact that those on the phone are, are feeling and experiencing in terms of what they're getting requested for on a daily basis. Um, Christian, just uh, on, on this topic, when, because you guys operate in a 10, 25, 50 year forecast environment, um, are you seeing, you know, everything pointing towards uh, just 
the demand skyrocketing and, and therefore you guys haven't just either consistently played catch up or try to figure out how to get ahead of this at some point? We will have some relief a little bit. I guess I did show our, our graph showing we're gonna have a little more production. The, the bright spot, I guess, as far as, as uh, supply balance, I guess, that we will see a little more production coming from the South on the range of 1.5 to 2.5 billion FDM. There's a slide that I had in there uh, showing that. Um, so we will continually, it does seem like we're gonna be, there's gonna be more demand if you look at the data uh, over the next three to five years, then there will be supply. So it's going to be, we're going to see higher elevated historical pricing at longer periods of time versus uh, any time that we've seen historically. So expect guys, uh, prices to remain extremely strong because of the current supply environment or demand environment that we're living into. Again, people say, well, why shouldn't, shouldn't we produce more? I guess it comes from a tree, and tree, I guess they do take a lot of time to grow, you know, getting aside, but there's no more trees, I guess, that can be cut based on allowable, uh, harvestable cuts in, in Canada. The only bright spot that will see more production is gonna come from the West, uh, from US South, sorry, by about one and a half to two and a half billion FDM. So there will be some uh, lower prices ahead. Um, there's normally reversal, and if I change the, change the mood here, there are a reversal of trends normally. In week number 10, where we see prices start coming down, historically, if you look at one, three, five, and 10 years, week number 10 is the point where we see price coming down, and but then it's for two months, then price start going back up again, normally week number 18. So we will see lower prices, maybe uh, a little break here, uh, but it does seem like uh, overall we'll see higher price overall in, in the future full term. I, I think, yeah. you know, one major takeaway is right that we're going to consistently see higher prices. At some point, it sounds like it's going to slow down, maybe taper off a bit, but we're going to be in this higher range. Um, those higher prices affect, um, I mean, we're not just talking about uh, one specific product, right? We have, you have to, our customers buy a significant amount of products. Um, and thinking about any specific products, we it feels like on the retail side of things that sheet goods and engineered lumber is kind of experiencing the biggest price increase uh, and the diff most difficulty in terms of availability um, versus the Doug Fir and Spruce markets just on the, the two by side, which are seem to, I mean, they're strained, uh, but there is availability and pricing seem to had kind of it hasn't peaked, but uh, it's going up more gradually. Um, can you either of you guys speak to um, the differentiation in products and where we should see um, maybe some things uh, plateau uh, while others will continue to skyrocket? So I think uh, right now, if you look at panel products in general, I it, it, this, it's safe to say that we're at at peak price, um, could it go higher? It is likely to go higher before it goes down. I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Um, and that's mainly because of continual production problems and record high demand. So you have resins that are used in these products and we, we you, you read it in the news all over the place that car manufacturers, computer manufacturers, you know, my kids wanted to buy a bicycle. Like recently I couldn't find a bike, like any of these raw materials to build anything right now is very, the whole supply chain is, is, is challenged. You have containers sitting empty in New York City, but they're, and they don't have any containers to fill in China and vice versa. Like, it's like we've swung the pendulum so far to one direction and it's, it takes time for that to cycle through. Um, the panel uh, markets specifically to lumber and building materials is probably seen the have been affected the most by that uh, because there's more input into those uh, products that go and, and manufacture them, they're the value added uh, nature of them. Um, I see that getting better um, in the second half of the year. So you're not, so in, in uh, Q, mid Q2, I'm sorry, Q, Q3 and into Q4 um, as new production starts to come online and the resin situation starts to calm down. Um, but that's, it's going to, to be it's going to be challenging here for a, for a little while. I mean, those products have gone up seven to 
to nine times, depending on the items, um, comparatively to lumber from their historical norms of two to three times, right? So uh, it's going to be a, be a little while. Um, you know, is a um, forty dollars a sheet for seven sixteenths OSB going to become the norm as we move forward? Probably not. Uh, but it doesn't mean that 25 to 35 might be more of the range. And we've never really traded there for, you know, the majority of my career. So uh, that's, that's something that we have to, you know, pay attention to and, and see, see how that plays out. Uh, there will be more production of those items, but again, those will be into the, you know, well into the second half of the year. And even if they bring more production on, they can't produce anything because they don't have the, 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 um, it's not that they don't have the lumber or the fiber to go out there and chip or the fiber to go out there and veneer. They don't have the, the, the products to go and lay those things up into a usable product um, or finished product. So it's going to take a little bit more time. Kyle, uh, one, one thing I just wanted to ask on that question, which um, might be a question that others have on the phone. Are you, are you seeing the Delta, the difference in price uh, decrease between premium products and non-premium products. So your kind of CDXs, OSBs of the world versus your Huber products. And is it a time, isn't it a point in time where you should take advantage and be jumping to premium products because the Delta is decreasing or we're not there yet? I, I don't necessarily see, I see everything kind of going up in tandem, um, but you're a little bit closer to it. Um, uh, on on, on, on lumber, yeah, yeah, on lumber products, and Christian will probably talk. Lumber products, the premium is tightening. The the the, the difference between a premium product and a commodity product it really is just about availability. So yeah. in most cases, like we we're tending to err on the uh, the level of cons of of conservative and buy more premium compared to just regular commodity uh, lumber. On the panel products, it seems to be going up the same amount, but yeah. not, not completely. Like if you looked at 23, 30 seconds commodity uh, versus uh, Advantech or versus uh, LP legacy, those spreads are starting to come in a little bit on the, on the sub flooring, right? I'm not necessarily seeing it on, on uh, some other items yet, but it's starting to, that's phenomena is starting to happen. I wouldn't say it's as um, um, closely correlated as what we're seeing in, uh, you know, commodity sticks or lumber pro products. Right. I think it's, I mean, I think it's important to know, at least ask the question of whatever lumber yard you work with or salesperson you work with, and, you know, at what point in time is it worthwhile to con consider jumping from a commodity product to a premium product? Because the premium product in the end is going to be typically less labor on the job, right? And we're in an environment where reducing labor costs uh, as much as we can is probably what you want to do. Uh, so at some point that premium product could be the better alternative uh, than just typically buying commodity products if the commodity products are going to accelerate in price faster than your premium products. Um, one thing that I, I thought was just a quick little bit, you know, more, maybe more granular, but worth quickly addressing is the thought process on engineered wood uh, versus trusses and whether um, we're in an environment where we think we should be, you should be considering um, looking at trusses as an, uh, a, not a necessarily a cost-effective alternative, but one that could help um, with the strained availability of iJoyce and engineered wood. Um, Kyle, any thoughts on that? I just, you know, I think it really comes down to time is money. It is a simple, uh, you know, analysis. And we as, as uh, specifically you as a builder and the developers, what have you, um, are trying to have so much coming at them in any way that you can um, limit uh, your exposure and uh, lessen uh, your time at the job site by being able to frame that product and get it under roof and ultimately provide a finished product. You should be looking at those uh, opportunities to do so. Um, who wants to waste time? You know, going back to the premium lumber question, who wants to waste time uh, dealing with uh, calls and sorting through lumber and what have you? Take the opportunity. It's expensive already. You know, what's a, what's a, you know, a few, a few more basis points to go out there and buy a superior product to allow you to take uh, less time at the job site to go out there and provide uh, your customer a finished product. And I think you should be, everybody should be looking at any of those options at any given time to do so. Yeah. Um, Christian, anything that you wanted to add to, to that question? Well, I'll, I'll go from a standpoint of, if you look at the reduction in, in DC with the wise, I guess, I think I would agree with Kyle, I guess the, the less, the more convenient it is for, for all the builders and on site, the better it would be for on the waste of time, the new labor, the constraint, 
and the easier components you can bring into a house or a built, that'd be the way to go in the future. Uh, there is a shortage. And one thing I wanted to bring from the previous question is that what it could happen basically is that now you don't have any engineering products and the flooring you can put on. So for us, as far as lumber, to build on top of these, these engineering products for the, for the flooring, they could build the inventory of screws or duct or emperor on the ground while we wait for those engineering products to, to catch up, I guess. So there is a challenge that we have to be careful here uh, that this whole uh, supply constraint, especially in OSB and EWP, is not slowing down the whole process. And uh, that brings me down to the 1.3 million housing start completion versus permits of 1.9. There is a gap that we're going to have to be careful here in, in, the, in the fourth year. Thank you. Well, uh, Carrie, it's um, it's almost uh, been an hour. Um, I haven't gotten any questions. Uh, I definitely would love to open it up to see if anyone had any specific questions uh, for either of any of us uh, uh, on the phone. I, I will unmute everyone or invite everyone to unmute if anyone has any last minute questions. So everyone has been asked to unmute. If anyone has any questions for Jason, Kyle, or Christian, feel free to ask them now. I'll ask a question. Is there is there any anticipated? This is more for Christian. I know you said you're increasing twenty percent. Do you have you heard from other mills what their plans are? Any any word of new mills being opened or um, more capacity going on in the near term versus and and versus and long term? In Canada, we're, we're at capacity right now. Everything points out that uh, we're going to produce 24 billion of VM in Canada in 2021. And uh, that's uh, basically about stable from the previous year. So Canada, we are at capacity. And we are looking at probably 1% to 2% uh, reduction in BC, I guess, on, on the mid-level term, I guess. So Canada, you can't expect anything coming from Canada, more production coming from Canada. The only uh, bright spot, I, I'd say it's, it's the U.S. South. There's uh, been a lot of investment. There's been some green, greenfield projects. Uh, we've seen about uh, Canfor, uh, Bender. We've seen a lot of people coming in the U.S. South to Southern Yellow Pine. Uh, and it, is that going to be enough with the 1.5 billion of VM more we're going to see in 2021? My answer is no. It's just not enough production to, to meet the demand that we're seeing right now. So. It's going to be tight on pricing. That's, that's why it's going to push prices higher for 2021. So just to kind of add like that, just give a little color. Like you have the western side of Canada coming down, eastern side coming up. But as far as the scale goes, it's really the net effect of it is very minimal coming out of Canada to answer Chris's question. And, you know, a lot of your customers, Jason, are buying, you know, Canadian Doug fur, right? So like that's a region that's gonna to continue to be impacted, you know, from less production, not more in the years to come. And uh, the US South is, is uh, definitely increasing, but just to put it in perspective, we saw one mill, one brand new mill start in 2021. That, the, the CapEx project, they broke ground two years ago. So this takes a lot of time to go and increase production, right? Specifically a greenfield operation. So uh, we do have two mills that are gonna start up. Uh, one uh, here in April and May uh, that was recently purchased by Binderholtz, a European producer who has a sawmill in um, uh, uh, Live Oak, uh, um, uh, Florida. That starts up here in uh, uh, April and May, but you know, when a mill starts up, it's not at full capacity. It starts up at about 50% of the pace and builds up over time. And so for that, you know, operation, which is projected to do around 200 million board feet of annual production, it's not gonna do 200 million board feet for like two quarters, maybe even three before it's even back up to that level and then and so forth. So again, the increases that happen uh, are not like flipping a switch. It takes a tremendous amount of time to bring that to the market. I have a question. How will we increase the transportation capabilities? Christian, you want to talk about that since you're a railroad owner, a rail, railroad owner? Uh, is that is the question more on local transportation with with trucks? Or are we talking rail line uh, or which? 
across across the board. I, I believe that it's an integral part of getting product to the marketplace, whether the production is there or not. To fulfill the need, we need the transportation, the drivers, the flatbeds, the ships, the containers. I'd say probably, and, and uh, I'm sure, not sure about the data, but probably three quarters of our products is moved from Canada to the US via railroad. And you're dealing with a non-reliable uh, logistical partner. I don't want to see the two letter that's, uh, that starts with a C and an N, but it's extremely unreliable. And then uh, basically, if you just go back historically for us, uh, not to say a lot of data, but it, it, we're talking hundreds and, and close to thousands of cars that they haven't delivered to us so that we can bring our product uh, to, to market. That's why we invested, uh, I think, seven, eight years ago in buying that 500 miles of rail and, and deal with the 30, 40%. Basically, so on a week to week, on a day to day basis, you don't know tomorrow if you're going to get cars from the or your logic, logistical uh, national partners from day to day. Um, they've been real unreliable at 30% range, I'd say. And that's why the investment for us paid off that we're able to bring our production to market without losing too much of the beat. But the industry in, in, in general, it's a monopoly. It's a rail line monopoly. And we're stuck with that one and then extremely unreliable. That's on the rail line. I'm not sure there's any quick fix. And I don't think there's any because there's no investment capital expenditure in new rail lines across the country, North America. And then you're looking at the new e-log that we put in place as far as trucking. And what I've heard recently is that you had the load that normally takes a day or two to find a trucker, it's up to two weeks. So there's a major demand, I guess, for, for truck and the rail line is extremely unreliable. So you're dealing with, uh, with uh, crutches, I have to admit. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I think this is gonna be a very challenging part of this uh, supply chain for unfortunately the next few years uh, and maybe indefinitely. Um, just with what you know, what we experience on the lumberyard end, uh, myself and a few of our peers in the industry have rail on our property. It was unreliable in two, 2016, 17, and 18. Um, so if it's unreliable, then it, it's it's going to be even more difficult now and has been. If we could get our hands on that kind of product, uh, which we can't, um, you know, so we're now reliant much more on trucking than we are on rail because the availability is not there to, to use rail. So it, that's a, that piece of it is, is seems, you know, not to use a big word, but I mean, it could be catastrophic from a transportation standpoint, but it sounds like it's going to keep people employed and, and you know, it's, and we're gonna have to adjust to, um, to the increased labor cost to drive interest, to add trucking and fleet members into the industry, um, which, at some point there's gonna be a transition of labor from some, maybe some of the services industries that have really fallen off post pandemic uh, to something else. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a six to 12 month fix. That's probably more of a, a three to five year situation. Um, it's just to add, it's gonna get worse before it gets better because we're going through um, you know, a restart of the economy. Uh, and you know, all estimates are GDP is gonna range anywhere from um, seven to 9% in the US, whoever would have thought that we're going to have that. So trucking, uh, it has options, right? So there's only so much trucking capacity and to haul forest products, to haul uh, other commodities, to haul whatever goods that they need to get from, from their manufacturer to the marketplace is now going to be, uh, there's, there's going to be a lot more options uh, that the limited capacity of our, uh, our trucking network has. And that's going to put strain in and ultimately it's going to, increase the cost. And, uh, um, but, you know, it's a cyclical wave, as you said, uh, Jason, and uh, I think we've done a disservice in, you know, in uh, training and recruiting for all the trades, uh, inclusive of trucking and what have you. And hopefully over this period of time, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quality job and quality employment. And I think it could provide a lot for uh, a family in the United States, and if we can increase that capacity, and I, I think we will over time, but it's you just have to allow that time to happen. Yeah, we just we have to see that labor transition, and um, we're not seeing it today. Um, any uh, anyone have any other questions or, or curiosities that they want to ask? Is there any 
potential for a European beetle kill situation that would create a lot more volume coming over here to North America? Or in view of the transportation problems, is that an impossibility? No, to answer your question, Mike, there's going to be a lot more European product coming here. That's the other region uh, that will um, ha ha add added um, supply to the North American market. Um, I don't have those slides with me, but I did have some from uh, a, a recent conference that Christian and I both attended, um, specifically to European products. We're still well below the peak of 2004 through 2008. Uh, but I think you're going to see European production continue to double year over year over year for the next, you know, two or three uh, based off that. The headwinds that are involved there, though, are freight. The freight uh, factors on containers and the freight on brake bolt have gone up 60 percent in one year alone in, since two, uh, 2020 to 2021. So they do have additional costs. And the other thing that they have is uh, they have a tremendous amount of demand domestically in Europe and also in Asia. So their prices, uh, not only have we seen two and a half to three times price increase in the US market, those other markets are willing to pay more as well. So that might continue to you know, swing uh, uh, the, the direction of where they're gonna push that product or not. But in all likelihood, European production is going to be more uh, than what we've seen in the previous five years over the next five years. Um, but again, it's still, uh, what's the total footage, Christian? You know the number. Uh, what's the footage that's coming here relative to the overall demand? Uh, Kyle, just real quick. I mean, what, what European production affects us in New England? There's some. There's a little bit of dug fur, but most of it stays into in from France and on uh, Germany stays there in that domestic market. We have at Sherwood Lumber brought some over. Uh, the majority of what you're seeing, though, is uh, Nordic spruce and Scots pine that would hit this marketplace. So, um, so for us, it would be more of a, a pricing impact than a actual product impact. Correct. Most of that product is, is from premium products that you guys um, talked about earlier. It, they, if you look at the data, they will increase their production 2021 by 2.3% is the actual number based on the forecast. And it's, it's mainly caused the, uh, because of beetle kill and a lot of blowdown, they call that. Uh, but as, as uh, Kyle mentioned, it's all going to be consumed uh, through internally uh, in Europe, but mainly in, uh, in China. So we will see some, uh, some production in, on the East Coast, from Florida to, uh, to Maine, basically, uh, with European lumber. But it's, uh, it's going to be a 5 to 10% increase. They just can't uh, supply their own internal market is what we've seen based on the latest conference. Okay. Uh, we actually just got uh, one quick comment uh, question uh, from Tom. He's curious if there's anybody on the phone who's a builder or a remodeler and what they're experiencing um, in terms of outlook and potential challenges. And I think one key thing is, can you kind of corroborate the affordability piece, which is, are you seeing a, a long enough forecast, uh, not just three months out, but six, 12, 18 months out, where you can support the fact that the affordability, it's still affordable despite the pricing increases that we're having. Um, and people are gonna to continue to buy and build homes. Maybe, maybe Carrie will set up a, after, uh, an email for after the fact. Um, where she could solicit answers on that question, uh, Tom. I don't. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on um, on that question, uh, but uh, please chime in if you do. Uh, thanks, Jason. Well, I, I'm talking to lumber dealers. I'm a salesperson at Sherwood, and I'm talking to lumber buyers for the most part that are continuing to buy. But I would love to hear from the builders and remodelers that are facing you know, a different set of challenges than the ones we are facing. I mean, I, if, if no one's gonna chime in on that question, I'll just see what I can just share a little bit about at, on our end, what our forecast looks like, which is, you know, we sell windows and doors that have lead times um, upwards of six to 12 months when you're in that higher end custom construction home. And those, that forecast is taking us all the way into Q3 or Q4 right now. Um, and those homes are, in, a, in their gestation periods, they're, they're, being, they're planning to be built. Um, they know what the pricing situation is 
and no one seems to be deviating from the plan. Um, so it seems like we're going to be carried through into the beginning of 2022. Um, and there could be certain projects that drop off, but we've had no project cancellations. We've had no project delays. Um, the, the world that we're seeing some delays in, you know, outside of kind of the HBRA community is more on the commercial end of things where your pricing changes impact you in terms in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars um, versus the 5,000 or $10,000 range. Um, so right now the, the pipeline's healthy and, um, you know, I'm very grateful that our customer base seems to be dealing with the challenges and kind of taking them in stride. Uh, it, it could be a much, it could be a much more challenging environment if everyone wasn't uh, accommodative. Thank you very much, Jason, Kyle, and Christian. Enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Um, one last question um, that came in, uh, came in from Joe. How should our builders budget their projects when you're only holding pricing uh, for a short period of time? Is current pricing holding or going to continue to spike on a consistent basis? Um, you know, I, I think from a retail standpoint um, on, on the lumber yard end, you know, we take what's given to us and we have to adjust to kind of continue to stay profitable um, and make sure that we can survive for a long period of time. Um, Kyle, I would say, are we in an environment where on a weekly basis, we're going to be hearing about increases and therefore we're going to have to be sharing that with our customer base on a pretty much daily or weekly basis? Historically, we've been, you know, month uh, in terms of changing prices. Yeah, um, Christian, you want to share the uh, twenty-year uh, volatility of the random length lumber index? Yeah, so guys, if you look at the data there, it, it seems like the last twenty years, on a weekly basis, uh, we've seen random length fluctuate by five dollars over the last average of the last twenty years, and in twenty, actually, in the second part of twenty twenty, uh, the average was uh, was uh, thirty dollars. So it just means that more volatility, extreme volatility. We saw record increases of one week of $200 on item that was never seen before. So I think the question at the base was the, what do you do if you're a builder? And, and I think you gotta pass the cost, I guess it's not, you're not profitable. And I don't wanna tell you guys what to do, but these prices, extreme volatility. And are they gonna go up? It I think it comes like down to, transparency and honesty. I mean, volatility creates um, a point in time where you have to be uh, communicating on pretty much a daily basis. Um, and the volatility we're yep. expecting right now yep. in prices really just speaks to, um, it's your, your, your planning is gonna be much more short-term than it is long-term. And um, you know, we're, because the entire supply chain is experiencing the same thing, we have to expect that the, the builder is going to have to adapt to experiencing that volatility and then sharing that communication, though challenging, uh, with their customer base as well. Absolutely. Like in Christian and I's world, our price changes in the minutes, right? We're talking like throughout the day, it's moving in big, in big fluctuations and the spreads that we experienced in 2020, you know, like Christian just mentioned, there's six times the volatility that we've ever seen in any given time on average. So you should, that means at certain times it could be 10, 15, 20 times. So you just, the level of communication, what we've talked to our sales and purchasing team is you uh, have to go out there and provide accurate, clear data every single day, every single phone call, every single minute. And if you can do that more often than not, um, you'll be able to, you know, weather uh, the, those, those price moves. Volatility is here to stay. Uh, how much higher we're going to go and ultimately where we adjust, you know, I'm not that good. I'm not an expert in regard to that. Um, but I am uh, very, very good at feeling, getting closer to when those are and preparing, uh, you know, what we should be doing at any given uh, part of those moments. Uh, but picking tops and picking bottoms, nobody has that clairvoyance. I mean, Otherwise, you'd see my background, you know, on some beach somewhere and uh, not here in the office. So, yeah. uh, but that being said, uh, the key is, 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 you know, trying to build as a transparent, you, you said it as much as the best way, try to build a transparent partnership with your yeah. vendors. So, and, and, and keep the communication levels very, very high. Well, we're, we're almost um, out of the pandemic. So you'll be on the beach soon enough, Kyle. Um, <laughs> 
I, I think, you know, it's, it's been past an hour. I appreciate everyone's time. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me directly at jason.cohen at northeastco.com. Um, if you have any questions for Christian or Kyle, I'm happy to kind of pass those on to them. Uh, also, the meeting has been recorded by HBRA, so Carrie will be sending out a recording of that to anyone who's interested. And um, again, I, I think it's important to keep the communication lines open. It sounds like we're in this crazy environment for, uh, for at least a, a decent period, a year or maybe two. Uh, but one takeaway I had from this you know, conversation is that it seems like you know, we, we can potentially afford it and we can, uh, can work through it. Uh, so hopefully that creates some cautious, cautiously optimistic uh, thought process. And, um, and I hope everyone gained a little bit of insight from, uh, from the call. So thank you everybody. And, and thank you, Carrie and the HBRA as well. Hey, thank you, me, Kyle, I guess I Christian, thank Jason. Thank you so much. Thank you Go guys. Ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I guess we're all in this together guys. Uh, Jason, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Kyle and the Sherwood family, you guys have been a top partner for all of us. So I want to thank you guys for that. And thank you. Let's stick together guys. And we'll, we'll get through that, that, uh, that volatility uh, together, I guess. So thank you and take care. Christian Kyle. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you guys.